Hey, how do you like that? Awesome. And the Thanks, mic is John. on. How do you like that? That's amazing. All right, let's give a big round of applause for John Willis, please. Thank you. Thank you. So DevOps Kaizen. Just uh, for you those who know, know me, um, done a lot of things um, for the purposes of this discussion. It started 10 years ago. I was one of the first cloud evangelists for private cloud with Ubuntu, working with Simon Wardley. That Adam Jacob character um, about seven or eight, seven years ago asked me to come in as the ninth person at Chef. Had just an amazing opportunity there uh, working for Adam. I, um, I've been a failed entrepreneur most of my life, but the last like seven years, the, the merger and acquisition gods have been very nice to me. I guess they, they knew they pummeled me for like 25 years, so I sold the company to Dell about four years ago. I was actually self-named the director of DevOps there. And then about a little less than three years ago, I had this crazy idea of putting SDN and Docker together. Um, and I didn't get the thing but three months and Docker acquired my company. Uh, so, and I just left Docker like three weeks ago. And now I'm working for a company called SG Technologies. So I'm kind of out of the software business and back into services, which is actually something I've been trying to do for 10 years. So there, that's me and all my presentations are always usually updated with the reasonable town for the last six years under a project called My Presentations. So, before we get started, uh, while I was at Docker, I, would, uh, I did a lot of work on the Alibaba deal um, and, um, in China. And so I would get invited to their cloud conference every year to keynote. And I guess I do this sometimes. And I guess, okay, that's kind of annoying to see it now. I have no idea what I was saying. Probably something about immutability and containers. And, <laughs> and, and the fun young men over at Sensu decided to have a little bit of fun <laughs> with it. And, and they're really good kids, but um, I don't know. They kind of take it a little too far. And then now, like other people have jumped on this thing. So if, you know, I try to stand like this when I'm giving presentations. Because, oh no, it's actually kind of cool. Because you know what? Like you can do all these cool things, like be a founder and start up and sell. But if you ain't been memed, you ain't nobody. And finally, <laughs> me and Muhammad Ali, like nailing it. I'm old, right? All right. Seriously, folks. Um, yesterday we did a, a summit, and I, I had this presentation I called "Why Executives Can't Change." And and um, you know they kind of get boxed into this, like everybody else seems to be doing this. I'm not able to do it. And so um, as I've gone back to services, in fact, a lot of over the last four or five years, so I am the co-author of DevOps Handbook. I spent a lot of time talking to companies about DevOps. I get bored into a lot of boardrooms to ask, oh my God, John, please help me understand what this really is. You know, this person tells me it's A, that person tells me it's B. And um, as I started thinking about um, going back to services, I started thinking about the tools that I've been used and how do I codify the answers that I've been giving. And, and I think it's, quite simple, and I think of it as a funnel. And, um, and, and the funnel starts with capabilities and assessment, and actually, two days after I joined SJ Technology, you know, I work with Gene Kim a lot and Nicole, and we are a Dora, you know, if you've heard about Dora, it's pretty awesome. It's a psychometric survey to understand your capabilities. You define um, key outcomes, and I'll, I'll go into this. This is kind of the boilerplate of what I'm gonna cover. And then the other thing that I've been a big fan is value stream mapping, and in fact, if you ask any of the original kind of poster child companies like the Targets and, and Ross Clanton or Courtney Kisser over at Nordstrom and now she's at Target, uh, I mean she's at Starbucks, sorry. Um, she, you know, they'll all say they, they, they usually wound up in some form of value stream mapping. So I'm gonna talk about that and why it's important. And then I'm a big fan of this idea of Kata, so I'll talk about that. And then you, saw, you heard uh, Ross talk about the dojo. He basically invented the concept of the dojo, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, and and it, I think it's an amazing way. So I think of this as the funnel of the right way based on all the, you know, the discussions I've had, the people I hang out with, the way we talk. I think this is the right way to do transformation. And so you start off with accept, assessment, and it basically is a baseline. And, and Nicole presented yesterday, and she said, it's okay that, to have the emperor have no clothes, right? Like, in other words, like you just need to know where you are. I, I spent a lot of time, um, Gene runs this thing, um, it's, a, it's about a 35, 40 person workshop that he does every year um, in Portland, and I've been, you know, 
I'm part of his cabal, but some of the brightest minds in the biggest inter- industries come there, and we literally do workshops to figure out how to solve the hardest problems. And a lot of what's come out of that is these capabilities, which now are part of DORA, but they're things that, 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 that are obvious that you can differentiate what we would call a low performer versus a high performer. And again, it's okay to be a low performer in the sense of baselining where you're at, right? In fact, that's, there's no way to go but up. So literally, you know, figuring out, and, and again, the capabilities, I'll show you some examples, but the key is that you're, you're looking at where you're at and then you're trying to define what your key outcomes. And, and I'll tell you, like, I'm a Deming freak. I hate MBOs. I think KPIs are bullshit. I think, um, I think that OKRs are the new cool kids way to just rename it. Um, like what I like is what, you know, like K, uh, the, um, you know, the, the models are broken. What you need to know is exactly what you're doing and what your capabilities are. And then once you can define those and some examples of, you know, a lot of what uh, Nicole Forstrom has done is intertwine cultural questions, behavior patterns, along with technical. And the data has shown consistently over and over and over again, and I'll have another slide on this, is that generative cultures are faster and more resilient. I mean, it's, it's a fact. I mean, it, the practicers of DevOps, and like, it, if you said that in 2009 the, the term was defined, I was at the first DevOps days in Ghent. I've been a practicer of this thing. Actually, I've been doing this for 30 years. But like, we, know in, we know empirically that this is correct. That the culture, if you get your, if you have a generative culture, like which is a sharing culture, which is a culture that accepts failure, and, and, and people who point out failure get promoted or accept, and, and rah, thank you, as opposed to a pathological organization that is, the, the, you know, he broke it, fire him, right? Like, the, like the, and we know that the generative cultures empirically and now statistically, you know, um, true, rigorous, academically valid uh, statistical data tells us, I think it's like 25,000 people have been surveyed over the last seven years, that general cultures go faster and are more resilient. And so you need to know where you are on that spectrum. And we have a good model now. It's called DORA. And we look at things like your lead time, your deployment frequency, your MTTR, how good are you at resolving things. Um, you know, what's your change rate status, um, what's your overall IT performance, which is actually an aggregate of those top four, which is really speed and resilience. You, you can see the kind of speed is lead time and uh, frequency, deployment frequency, MTTR, and success is your resilience. Like, you want to know that. And by the way, I, you know, there's probably about 140 capabilities that you can track. There's only two I give a shit about, and it's lead time and MTTR. And if your lead time's going down and your MTTR is going down, and you can track that, like, what else matters? You're faster and you're more resilient. And so that's a quick briefing on the DORA thing um, and, and how you can do these assessments. Um, there are a lot of partners. We're one of them. Um, you can come in and survey people. It's a 20-minute survey. You get a ton of data that at least gives you some insight. And it's valid statistical data. But the thing to me that I think is the most important, because I've done this over and over, and this works. And again, when I go ask people who are kind of poster child for enterprises who have been successful with DevOps, and, and successful is a double quote expression, <laughs> um, that almost all of them tell me they had some form of what comes from Lean, which is called value stream mapping. Now, the model that I, I've kind of co-wrote with a friend of mine, Damon Edwards, who's uh, on my DevOps Cafe po uh, podcast, co-host, is this idea what we call, it's not straight value stream mapping. There are good books on value stream mapping. I can point you to them if you want. But we call it the black pen, red pen, blue pen model. So the idea is you literally have to get about eight or ten subject matter experts who own the value stream across the value stream. And, and if you tell me that, like, we, oh my god, there's no way I can put ten people in a room for three days, I'm like, move on, somebody else. Because I think you're, you're broken. That's, my, that's your first test when it comes to me. If you tell me you can't give up three days, you're, you're dying and bleeding and it's like, triage, and you can't give up three days from your, um, your subject matter experts, then you have no idea. And like, sorry, you're not allowed to use the word transformation anymore. <laughs> and then you, um, 
and then you red pen it. And we'll talk about this, because this is brilliant. Da this was Damon Edwards' idea. He takes the, the Mary Poppins' seven lean wastes. So now it's not just, uh, oh, that's a waste, I think. No, no. Here's a book written by uh, somebody who is so critical on our industry, Mary, Pop Mary and Tom Poppin, called Lean Software Development. And she's identified and codified waste in software. And then you, as a team, you blue pen it, which is the countermeasures. And guess who's not in that room? The person who paid me to come do this. In fact, they're not allowed in until the third day. Because even the countermeasures then become stickies where they dot vote on which ones should be the ones that get put in the storyboard. It's an amazing thing if you've ever been through one. Um, and what you wind up is, this is an anonymized version of one. This is a very interesting one. It's actually a company where um, the person per per who brought us in was um, always hearing that he needed to buy more F5 load balancers. And every time he'd buy more, nothing would change. And, and so what we found out is it really had nothing to do with the, um, with the um, F5 load balance. It was that the developers had to actually code some XML that actually went in that helped to do the geography distribution of the load balancing. And there was always mistakes there hidden. And so when he comes in the third day, it was brilliant. He's like, I knew it. I knew it. I told you guys to stop telling me to buy these things. I, it had nothing to do with more load balancers, right? Um, you know, you, you start you know, looking for lean waste, structured waste, and this is the Mary Poppins seven ways. You notice there's eight, because actually Damon brilliantly added one called Heroics. We did a podcast with Mary Poppins. She was like, oh my God, I'm adding that eighth one. Because it's a real thing, Heroics. Um, and I'm going fast, right? I got 30, oh, I got 18 minutes left. Um, you know, and then, um, you know, the, your countermeasures. And, and here's the thing, too, about value If you've never heard of this, it's brilliant. You get the subject matter experts in a room, and you start with, and, and everybody has this hierarchical in their mind construct, like the teams, and, and all of a sudden you're mapping the value stream, and you're like, block, and you go right from left. You go, block, block, I want to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Between those two blocks, there's block, 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 block. And it's like, and then somebody else is like, yeah, but there's really a block, 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 block. And then, like, you ha then you see this amazing, em empathetic uh, transactions happen. Like, I always wondered why you took two days to do that. Yeah, because you sent an email to UK, and, like, it usually takes three days to get just a response, right? It's like these magical things that have nothing to do with mainframe COBOL applications or buying new load balancers or, you know, their scripts or, you know, little handoff paper-based things that nobody knew actually happened, except the two people that are always mad that they have to do it. And then you take that data and you build a Kanban board from it. And in fact, what you really wind up doing, and this is the thing I love, is you wind up starting with the measurements, you define the key outcomes, what do you expect? I want to reduce my outage time. Simple, hey, I'm Delta, I fly Delta. Once a year, I get stuck in some city for three days. Like, I mean, they're great in every aspect of their business, except no disrespect, and I'm actually trying to help Delta in this regard. In every other aspect, they're best of class, except IT. Right, so you measure, you get your key outcomes, you then tie those to your countermeasures, and then the countermeasures drive, and we use a modified Toyota Kata A6 storyboard, which is basically target condition, current condition, what are the improvement metrics, how do you know you improved, uh, what's the blockers and the workloads, and those become the stories. Remember, the team dot votes what goes into the backlog. So it's not some manager deterministically saying, hey, this must be done. I mean, there's a must be done up there, but there's no must be done in the middle here. And the other thing that's beautiful about this is you keep iterating this virtuous cycle, because then you assess. And the reason why you're allowed to have the emperor has no clothes or be completely wrong on your guess, because guess what? I mean, I'm a big fan of Deming. It's scientific method. It's called PDSA or PDCA, which is plan, do, check, act. And you know what we do really well in this industry? Plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do. Yeah, I'm great at plan, do, right? Like, but plan, do, check, act. And what plan, do, check, act does is says, like, it's okay to be wrong. In fact, being wrong is really cool. We just learned a whole lot, right? And, and so that's the kind of the, the idea of the kind of full cycle. And what's really brilliant about this is, you one, it's a living thing. So some people do uh, value stream mapping. They come in, value stream map, bop, we're out of here. We'll see you when you want to do another value stream. What 
uh, what people wind up doing, and we recommend this, is this becomes your Kanban. So one of the things about DevOps is it's about visualization. I mean, what, like you can list all the things you do. CI, CD, you should do this. You'd have blameless post monitor. You'd have all this stuff, right? But like if somebody didn't tell you right off the bat is visualize the hell out of everything, like then you're missing a, a key component of what you should be doing. And this is why I love Kanban boards, because they're the ultimate visualization of the flow and the cumulative flow and how your supply chain works. But what gets really beautiful is when the value stream that was, is the predicting version of what you're doing is all tied. So you can take a key outcome from the capabilities, tie that to the countermeasure that you think is going to improve it, drive it through the Kanban thing, and at any point you can look at the chain of why this came, why this came into existence and what we're trying to solve. And you just constantly iterate. So this is always on the board. And it's changing dynamically. Usually it's handwritten. We probably hire her. She's probably doing it. Hey, did you write a value stream map over there? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was like, whenever I get an interpreter in Japan, I'll just start talking gibberish for the first minute and a half. And the, the interpreter will be like, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> <laughs> just can't resist the, the kind of goofball in me. Um, so then there's that next part of the tunnel is, OK, well, how do I learn how to be, learn how to be, learn how to be good? How do I learn how to be a learning organization? And, and, um, you know, and, and a gentleman called Mike Rother codified this to something called Toyota Kata. And you know, there's this great quote from uh, Bruce Lee, which is, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. That's Kata. You know, Kata comes from like you, a kabuki theater or karate. Like, I'm just, I'm going to memory muscle this thing so well. So you have this Kaizen mindset. And then you have this Kata that you're trying to create. So at this point, it's a funnel. You get your capabilities, you've driven down to understanding a value stream, you know what you're predictive, you're going to act like scientists to do stuff. Hey, I'm, let me say it again, you're going to act like scientists. Doesn't that sound appealing? To, to predict and check the outcome of what you do. And now you're going to basically become the karate expert, right? And, and so this book changed my life. I don't like to say that too often. But Mike Roth is Toyota Kata, has nothing to do with IT. But if you want to know why Toyota, from about 1980 to 2005, decimated the market at every level, and I'm telling you decimated, you know, with no caveats, um, is because they basically, ha he describes exactly, in fact, at the beginning of the book he says, there's been 100 books written about Toyota, but none of them talk about the hidden side. And it was the kata. It was the way people thought. And it's so DevOps. You read that book and like, oh my goodness, every presentation you hear at a DevOps day, like that's what Toyota was doing. And that, the head fake is, you know, after four or five years of, of studying DevOps, we realize, oh, we're just reiterating lean. And where did lean come from? Oh, it came from Toyota. Where did Toyota come? It came from Deming. But that's another whole discussion. <laughs> and by the way, we talk a lot about lean in this book, the DevOps handbook. You know, we talk about, and you know, you can't get around it. I would say that continuous delivery does not equal DevOps. DevOps does not equal continuous delivery. But it's a, far, it's a, it's a core primitive that you can't dance yourself around. I mean, you're going to wind up in this place. So, I mean, you've heard this over and over, version control, everything, small batch, trunk-based deployment. But if you haven't heard it, this book gives you 48 case studies. Um, but then I will tell you, we know this, the behavior matters. Generative behavior matters. So, you know, this everyone's responsible. We're going to share the load. Uh, done means release. So there's never, I, I, I really want to kind of eliminate, like, get me king of vocabulary. You shall not ever use the word project ever again in, in so, project, you're out of here. I don't even like the word product. It's services. Because both of those give you this get out of jail free card to say, we're done. No, it's a service. And if you look at the web scale companies, like the Facebooks and the Googles, they all think of these as services. And people own a service. And there's only one, there's like two ways you get out of the service. Owner of service is, you know, a developer, the ops, the network, whatever, is you either die or they deprecate the product. And, or you can ask for a transfer. But by definition, you're part of that service. You're not done. But this, the service is, like, why would it be done? You think in a year from now, like, the technology of your, your competitors is going to be the same where yours is? There's no such thing as done. And, you know, if you haven't seen the DevOps survey, we've got, um, we've got um, seven years of this data. Uh, in 2014, Nicole Forsman came in. She's the unicorn of all unicorns, PhD, statistician, brilliant, 
nice as can be. Uh, I'm her biggest fan. Um, she came in 15 and proved something that was so beautiful, right? Brilliantly beautiful, which was that if you, because she gave the question to ask you whether you were pathological or generous, and you didn't know it. Same time, she was asking you questions like, how fast do you deploy? How often do you recover? And this magical thing happened that, that anybody who was practicing these beliefs knew, empirically, actually showed up statistically valid, which is, if you had a generative behavior culture, you went faster. But here's the real kicker. You actually were more resilient. And in fact, we've found now over the next couple, since 2015, that the faster you go, the more resilient you get. So that golden triangle, bang, gone. Throw it out. Anybody walks in the room, talks about it, out of here. Right? And even the DevOps, the, you know, the core chronic conflict, if you will, of DevOps is Dev needs to go fast, Ops needs to slow down. Well, that's not true. It's not true. The, the thought leaders in DevOps will tell you it's not true. There's academically rigorous statistical data will tell you it's not true. In fact, you're really, really hurting yourself if you're allowing your organization to still believe that old model. Because your competitors don't, and they know that there's a new triangle in town, folks. It's that if you have a generative behavior culture, you will go faster, and you will be more resilient. Now, of course, it requ requires tools, either Chef, or uh, Ansible, or Terraform, or Docker, or whatever. It, it requires you know, a, a, a way to think about software delivery and a pipeline and all that, right? You, you, you have to have those fundamentals. And how do you get there? Like this is a 2006 slide that still is relevant today, right? It is the, it's the why this continuous delivery works. We're not just all bragging about it and talking about it because it's some like, wow, that's cool. It's because if, if you think of the model that was actually defined by Jez, Dan North, and Chris Reed back in 2006 Agile, and this is the Wikipedia version, which still stands strong today, which is this idea of, you know, you, uh, somebody checks in code, it goes block, block, gate, go back. Block, 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 gate, go back. And when you do that, as it's the shift left model, right? As you're constantly creating these gates, by the time you've done this over and over, you are creating incredibly resilient software. And in fact, there is, uh, going back to Toyota, I'm a big geek on Toyota um, Lean, and, and, and I know there's Toyota people in the, in the audience, and I'd love to geek out with you, because I am a big fan of like Toyota Ono and what happened there. But um, there's a great story about a Kentucky plant that was producing like 2,200 cars a day. And a reporter went down there to kind of investigate. And they asked the uh, plant manager, um, how do you produce 2,200 cars a day? In fact, I, I skipped one part, which is how many people have heard the end on cars? So in Toyota, back in the day, there was a rope. And anybody in line could pull the rope and stop the line. And in fact, in Rother's book, he describes that when you stop the line, the, the, the floor manager would actually come up to you, and the first thing they would say is thank you, before they even knew what happened. That was the culture. Because pulling an Andar cord was a, created a, a systemic learning organization. You wanted people to create failure. That's a generative culture. And so this, this, and this uh, Kentucky plant basically answer was, oh, it's quite simple. How, how do we produce 2,200 cars a day? We pull the end on cord 5,000 dollars a day. Like if that makes sense to you, you get this anti-fragility concept. It's, it's basically this. And in fact, it's actually this. And I can tell you this is like four years old where Google, um, I saw a presentation about six months ago. The new number is that Google runs 150 million automated tests a day. That's that Kentucky plant. And don't, don't tell me I'm not Google. Oh, John, I'm not Google, right? Because uh, this is stole from Pete Cheslock, and some of you are saying, uh, he, you know, so I shamelessly stole this for him that, like, this guy's so full of shit. He's never worked for anyone. My first job was at Exxon, so I worked in the enterprise. And you're saying, like, all oh, this unicorn shit, I'm going to have somebody, my boss is going to come back for this thing and tell me, oh, this guy, he's telling me. But we have evidence of companies. We run this DevOps Enterprise Summit with Gene. This will be our fourth year. I encourage you to go because you'll meet other enterprises and you'll hear stories of Ticketmaster and Nordstrom and Target. They're all basically, if I had to summarize this slide, they're creating generative cultures. They're the new triangle that are basically faster and more resilient. Story, there's videos on YouTube. Um, you can watch these companies over and over. 
And, um, and, and here's the other thing. You heard a little bit about this morning. One of the things I'm really fascinated about is, like, why do we treat security as a complete different supply chain? Like, anybody want to help me understand that one? Because the best quote I heard at RSA early this year was, a bug is a bug is a bug is a bug. A like, security defect is a bug, folks. Like, it's not that, oh, well, that's that kind of bug, and maybe we ought to talk to those people. So I'm really fascinated. In fact, I'm writing a class. I wrote a class called Intro to DevOps for the Linux Foundation, and it's out there, and it's free. I'm actually finishing up a course um, on Intro to DevSecOps, right, which is we need to start, like, having this system, system view of how we think about security at all levels of the pipeline. Because what we're actually doing is a real, imagine if, most of you are probably pretty hip, imagine if today that um, you walked in a shop and said, you know what, we're going to skip the whole source control thing, we're going to hold off on that Jenkins stuff, but we're going to run behavior-driven development. Awesome. You'd be like, well, yeah, you know, that might help a little, but, because that's what we're doing in security right now. People are shimming in uh, vulnerability scanning, maybe adding some kind of pen test dynamics. And nobody stopped and said, well, wait a minute. Why don't we treat the, the chain just like we, treat, where we should have some type of software defined at every level? And, and you know, and, and, you know, and I've, I've been working with these guys in Australia, but, but like, you, you know, like, in the, well, first you need training. Like, the, the developers should be trained on the concepts. They should understand that security is as important as everything else, like operations. Um, you know, the, we, we embed in our IDEs tools that say, oh, whoa. This would be a really bad idea, dude, right? And then, um, then we, you know, we we do some. We definitely do any type of analysis, binary analysis, static code analysis in the build. We had automatic uh, testing and detect vulnerabilities, configuration definitions. If you're using cloud, I don't know how many times you'll see people set up a VPC where they cut and paste from Stack Overflow. Oh, I think this will work. Oh, those four statements will kill you, like Booz Allen, the NSA data. And by the way, one of the labs I've been working on, I'm really proud of for this, our workshop, is actually um, a kill chain. So I get this kill chain, it's awesome. I saw a demo of it, and I'm like, oh my god, I gotta write this, this as a lab. And like, so you got two VPCs, you've got kind of an outer VPC that's running uh, Apache Stretch 2 for a, in a Tomcat scenario. Somebody does a port scan, they get it on 8080, they're inside the, the interface facing um, uh, perimeter. They then do a scan and they find a default install Jenkins, please don't do that. Um, and, and some of the things that happen to default Jenkins install is they have scripts that no need no authorization. So this smart attacker then actually takes over and runs a script that creates an Amazon account that actually now starts scanning your S3 bucket. So we build that lab and then we build the, the tool, I have a Docker like container that has all the tools to do the kill chain and then I force you to go install all the products that have to be there to, to see that that kill chain can't happen if you've had a shift left mentality. Uh, finally, I'm running out of time, but I think the whole Kaizen, um, we talk about the difference between a kind of straight line and, and a small J, big J. Our, our projects, you saw this a little bit from Adam, but we think that there's a start to stop, but almost all projects have this dip. If you think about the Kaizen model, it's actually um, what we call little J's. So it actually becomes a straight line. So projects become these little J's of, and it's really just, again, it comes from Toyota, it comes from Deming, it's called Plan, Do, Check, Act. And you just constantly, and Rother does an amazing job explaining this in his um, uh, Toyota Kata book, where he talks about current conditions and target conditions, and that's why we use the A6 here. The idea is that these are complex, like Adam pointed this out, sorry, you work in complex adaptive systems, whether you like it or not. And so Rother clearly just tells you that these are non-deterministic, these are models that you have to be adaptive at all times. So your big J projects are just not going to work unless you break it up, not only in small chunks, but how you think about the plan to check act, plan to check act. And Rother does an amazing job of explaining these forms. And then last but not least, the end of the funnel, you know, and like Ross Clanton basically invented this genre. Um, I, got, I was fortunate enough to visit this place in Target. Um, now he's doing it over at Verizon. Um, this idea of the dojo, I think it's the right way because here's the thing. The thing I love about the dojo, and I'm probably going to need one more minute before you hook me off, but um, the um, thing, here's what I love about the dojo is when I really thought about it is the dojo is a pull model. And so even when I work with companies and I get people to accept one value stream here, one, I mean, 
There's some banks that are 17 business units with 10,000 value streams, right? Um, like, so you come in, you shim in, and you get one little value stream in one business unit, and everybody's rah, rah, rah. And then what happens when that group tries to tell everybody else they need to do it? <laughs> right? But the beauty of the dojo is it's not a push model. It's a here. Build it, and they'll come. And they do come. If you ever go watch some of Ross's presentations where, excuse me, Ross, but he started in a really small room. And a couple years later, it's 15,000 square foot where people are begging him to get in front of the line to get in. And that's what happens because you allow you, you force a cultural model that you want the behaviors to happen either technically and culturally, the behaviors. You immerse people in how to think differently about Kaizen, Kata. The uh, original target used a lot of Eric Ries's Lean Startup. And the people come in and they might not like this and they might not like that, but when they get through the tunnel, they're like, I don't have anything better than this, right? And then like they're like bragging about it at some meeting, and they're like, "How'd you do that?" Oh, well, this this dojo thing. Hey, Ross, give me like five thousand more square feet, right? Ross is in the back of the room. I'm making fun of him, but not in a good way. Ross is amazing, and so we're we've been thinking a lot about this, right? Like, how do we help people? So I'm in working with the public sector a lot now, right now, and I'm going to help them build like a common government dojo. Right? And, and you know, this idea, and again, I, I blatantly stole this from Ross, but like the five day flash builds, the 30 day challenges, people are writing books about this, companies are doing this left and right. This is the right, it's a sustainable, systematic way to take that minimal one or two value stream to aggregate it, pull it in, and expand it out. Hey, that's got to be a picture for a meme. Um, anyway, um, just uh, my little um, shameless pitch for my new company. Um, probably the, the workshop's fun, we do that, but the DevSecOps workshop is killer, man. I'm telling you, um, we go through it all, you know, behavior driven, we use open source tools, um, it's, it's a blast, um, plus we do the retrospective. Anyway, thank you so much, and thank you for giving me a couple extra minutes.